Massive disclaimer, I freaking love this game. Jazz Jackrabbit was one of those games that I practically worshipped as a kid, and in my eyes it is a prime example of DOS gaming at its finest. So in true lazy game reviews fashion, I'm not going to just simply look at the gameplay and tell you how awesome it is, because that would be far too easy. Nope, this is a straight up Jazz Jackrabbit extravaganza, and we'll be looking at the game, its history, its versions, merchandise, and of course the gameplay itself. And to start things off, we've got to go back in time to the early 90s in a little European country known as the Netherlands. The home computer scene was in full swing and the Commodore Amiga was king. But the IBM PC running MS-DOS was quickly rising in popularity due to the decreasing costs of 256 color VGA graphics cards, sound cards like the Creative Sound Blaster, and fast CPUs like the Intel 486. While the Amiga still owned the computer gaming market and video game consoles like the Sega Mega Drive were gaining serious popularity, plenty of clever nerds were taking advantage of the PC's ever-increasing awesomeness. One of these amazing individuals was Arjen Brige, a Dutch demo scene coder with the group Ultra Force. Today, you might be more familiar with his work at Guerrilla Games, known for their PlayStation game series Killzone. He was responsible for some seriously impressive demos, such as Vector Demo in 1991, the first demo to use true 3D imagery on the PC. It displayed filled 3D vector graphics at a constant frame rate, which ran on even a lowly AT Class 286 PC. Obviously infused with nerdy Dutch superpowers, Aryan decided to start in his own PC game, a platformer inspired by Amiga games like Zool and Turrican. Meanwhile, in America, there lived a young nerd with a Polish surname, Cliff Blasinski. At age 17, he sent a game of his titled The Palace of Deceit, Dragon's Plight to Tim Sweeney, founder of Maryland-based computer game company Epic Mega Games. Turns out it was pretty rad, and a follow-up game titled Dare to Dream was released by Epic the following year in 1993. Although it wasn't a big success, Cliff gained valuable experience and also got to work with the very talented Robert Allen and Nick Stadler. And yes, this is the same company now called Epic Games, known for their hugely successful Gears of War series and the Unreal Engine, just in case you were wondering. Things were going well enough at Epic that Tim Sweeney was on the lookout for new talent for the company and ran across Aryan's amazing Vector demo in early 1992. After spending several months trying to recruit him, he finally agreed to work with Epic Mega Games. It turned out Aryan was already hard at work on his Amiga-inspired game for the PC, but at that point he didn't have any real characters or story laid out. In the preliminary stages, the game had a main character that was inspired somewhat by Vubo Ockels, the first Dutch citizen in space. While I can only imagine how awesome a game starring a mustachioed astronaut physicist would be, the idea was only temporary and that's where Cliff Blasinski's creativity came into play. He had the idea for a sort of Rambo rabbit, a bunny with an attitude, a bandana, and a big gun. He himself was inspired by Sega Genesis games like Gunstar Heroes and Sonic the Hedgehog, and eventually he came up with Jazz Jackrabbit. As for the origins of the name, Cliff had a dog named Jazz, who was named after the Transformer, also named Jazz, and Jackrabbit worked due to alliteration and it was an animal, so it worked out. While his fur was originally purple, green was the final color chosen, and this rabbit's mug was to become one of the most recognized faces of shareware games in the mid-90s. Well, recognizable after Nick Stadler got on board at least, as he reworked many of the character art assets and animations near the end of development, going for more of a classic Looney Tunes vibe than whatever it was supposed to be before. Jazz Jackrabbit was eventually released on August 1st, 1994 on various bulletin board systems and internet providers like CompuServe. Following the popular shareware model, the first episode of Jazz was released completely free of charge and free to share, which ensured that crap tons of people downloaded it worldwide. If you wanted more, and of course you did, the rest of the game had to be purchased via phone or mail order directly from Epic Mega Games. It was well worth it if you bought the full game because you not only got a lot more gameplay, you got this sexy Jazz Jackrabbit comic book slash manual. Its artwork was drawn by Nick Stadler and it's full of humor and win, with references to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Sonic the Hedgehog and other things to make you smirk. 
It also doubles as the game's documentation with information on everything from the controls to the story behind the levels to the enemy designs. You also get this awesome drawing of the developers of the game. <laughs> I especially love the depiction of Cliff Blasinski. It's quite the stark contrast to his look today. I got my first copy of the game on a shareware floppy disk from Epic, which came with the full version of Epic Pinball. It contains the entire first episode of the game and not really much more. Eh, I still played through this version endlessly. It starts off with an example of Nick Stadler's excellent animation and graphical talents, showing Jazz being his awesome self, all while Robert Allen's totally rockin' Jazz Jackrabbit theme song plays in the background. All the music is in glorious S3M tracker format and using an awesome set of samples to compose some seriously catchy grooves. If you've played Epic Pinball, this is the same guy and the same sample set, so it's just awesome. In the shareware version of the game, you are introduced to the basic plotline of the game, such as it is. It builds on the idea of the classic Aesop's fable, the tortoise and the hare, with rabbits and turtles still duking it out 3,000 years into the future. This turtle, Devin Shell, leader of the turtle terrorists, has kidnapped this rabbit, Eva Earlong, the princess of the rabbits, who just happens to have a lovely rabbit rack, as part of a scheme to conquer the planet Caratus. It's up to you, as the soldier of fortune Jazz Jackrabbit, to take down Devin with the help of your gun, the LFG-2000. <laughs> a not-so-subtle reference to the BFG-9000 from the first-person shooter Doom, which makes me wonder what LFG stands for. Little f***ing gun, perhaps? Whatever the case, awesome reference is awesome. You've got controls for moving, jumping, shooting, and changing weapons, as well as a slow-motion mode that nobody in their right mind would use. And you go around collecting weapons and power-ups in order to progress through a bunch of levels spread across various planets, further split into episodes. After selecting your difficulty and being amused by the various jazz artwork, you can select the episode you'd like to play. Of course, in the shareware game, you can only play the first episode, which can be completed in roughly 20 minutes, but the full game features six episodes in total. Each one contains at least three planets with two levels each, a couple bonus stages, one boss stage, and sometimes even a secret level. I always liked the artwork introducing these episodes, especially the Gene Machine, which shows Epic Mega Games' Jill of the Jungle character, and the Chase is On, which shows what appears to be Terminator Turtles. Start the game and you're greeted with whatever planet you're about to play on, and you'll notice that the bright and colorful artwork from the menus continues into the main game, and I love it. Everything is fantastically drawn, bright, and animated, from the backgrounds, the enemies, to Jazz himself. I especially appreciate the little things, like when you get Jazz too close to a ledge. Or leave Jazz alone for a second, and he'll whip out a carrot and state with his Bugs Bunny-ish voice. What are you doing? Yes, breaking the fourth wall in games is fantastic. These little animations might remind you a bit of the Sonic the Hedgehog games, and the similarities to that game certainly don't end there. You've got Jazz's crazy running speed, worlds filled with maze-like platforms to explore, checkpoints to pass, shields to collect, stars of temporary invincibility, running shoes to breeze through levels with, and even an airborne sidekick that tags along for the ride. But unlike Tails, this little half-pheasant half-eagle actually has a use. These are known as hip-hops, and if you happen to find a cage and free one of them, they'll stay with you and shoot any enemies nearby with bird loogies or something. At least until you get hurt, and then he'll instantly teleport to another dimension, I guess. I really don't know what the deal is with him leaving. Of course, two of the biggest differences between Jazz and Sonic is the fact that Jazz has a health bar, which is replenished by eating carrots, and he carries a big blue gun to dispatch enemies. This can be filled with different types of ammunition, all of which are limited other than the main type, the blaster. This is the gun you'll use most often, which fires weak bullets and can be fired as fast as you can press the button, so it gets tiring unless you happen to find rapid-fire power-ups scattered around the level. These will disappear if you die, though, so having a turbo controller would really help out here. If only there were such a thing for the PC. Oh wait, what's this? These little collectibles that look like game controllers spread all throughout the game. And billboards in the background saying all kids love Gravis Gamepad. Ooh, the Gravis Gamepad, the official joystick of Jazz Jackrabbit. Holy crap, not one, not two, but four buttons with rapid freaking fire. I must have one, ah. Thank you, PC Gaming Gods, for this divine feast for the hands.
If Jazz Jackrabbit is anything to go by, Epic Mega Games and Advanced Gravis Computer Technology were in bed together during this time period. And so, all throughout Jazz Jackrabbit, you'll see references to the company's products. So, of course, as an impressionable young lad, it was drilled into my head that their stuff was top-notch. And really, that idea wasn't completely wrong. The Gravis Ultrasound is still considered one of the best classic sound cards ever, and the Gravis PC gamepad isn't too shabby either. It was the first gamepad for IBM-compatible PCs, so you could not only play games that were looking more and more like console games on your computer, you could use a controller that wasn't so dissimilar to the Super Nintendo's. And not only that, but it had the aforementioned turbo buttons, and the controls were customizable, so you could make whatever button you needed shoot faster than I shoot my evil clones whenever they show up at the front door. It even had a switch that swapped the button layout so that you could play left-handed, if you're one of those weird people. And there was even a Master System-style screw-in joystick for the D-pad. The main problem I have with this thing is that it just feels kind of cheap. It doesn't feel as solid as a Genesis or Super Nintendo controller, and the D-pad is pretty bad, feeling too imprecise and gummy for my taste. Sorry, Epic, as much as you pushed the Gravis gamepad on me, I still prefer the good old keyboard for playing Jazz Jackrabbit because so much of the game hinges on precision platforming. Jazz moves very fast, and even at slower speeds, he feels a bit twitchy. So while most of the time you can just fly through a level at high speeds, you're going to want to slow down and take your time on many sections to avoid getting killed off. You've only got so many lives, and even though you can save the game, it's annoying to have to go into the menu and reload them. You've also got a time limit to worry about, which further adds to the frustration if you don't soon get a handle on these controls. Not only that, but it often feels like Jazz is just too darn fast for his own good, mostly because of how zoomed in all the action is. There's only so much of the level viewable around you, so going too fast or making a jump too hastily often ends with pain, which will send Jazz flying backwards with only a second of invincibility before he can get hurt again. This is really one of the very few issues I have with the game. A slightly larger line of sight and some toning down of the damage knockback would have gone a long way in making the game even more fun. But overall, the game is pretty forgiving, with great level design, mostly weak enemies, and several weapons to use. Other than the blaster, you've got the toaster, which is kind of a more powerful version of the blaster. The bouncer, which shoots bouncy blue grenades. The RF missile, which shoots two strong missiles that travel in an outward V shape. And TNT, Dino Might, which acts as a kind of mine that deals heavy damage when it goes off. Another item you'll occasionally come across is the totally rad hoverboard. As an avid Back to the Future fan, I loved this thing. Once you get it, you'll be able to take your sweet time in the level and shooting crap while flying on a freaking hoverboard. All while enjoying incredibly sweet animated graphics, smooth gameplay, and bobbing your head to the amazing soundtrack which I swear somehow just gets better with age. And every so often, you may run across a big floating red gem. Collecting this will grant you entrance to a bonus level at the end of the current world. These take place in a third-person perspective, and the goal is to gather enough blue gems before the time runs out and avoid obstacles like stop signs and barf-inducing spinny things. Each bonus level changes in appearance with each episode, and are pretty similar in theme to the bonus stages in Sonic games, especially the ones in Sonic CD. You also have the option to enter a secret level here and there, if you can find it, that is. I remember when I first found the secret level in the Shareware game, holy crap, this was the first time I had ever found a secret without the help of a strategy guide, and I was so proud of myself. I probably played that secret level for three hours once I got in there. This first secret level lets you play as a hip-hop, with dozens of other similar birds flying all around. It also features these statues, which if you're a fan of Epic's One Must Fall 2097, you'll recognize as being modeled after the Katana robot from that game. In a much later secret level of note, you get to play as a funky-looking drunken lizard with mad jumping skills. These secret levels are just awesome and are extremely memorable to me from playing this game as a kid. You also have loads of little secrets within the normal gameplay, with tons of breakable or false walls and alternate pathways that lead to extra lives or weapons or who knows what. 
and each planet provides new enemies, new music, new environments, and sometimes even totally different gameplay like these underwater sections which I think kind of suck, but whatever. After you complete all the planets in an episode, you're greeted with a boss or guardian level. These are another somewhat disappointing part of the game since almost all of these are stupidly simple to take care of. Unlike the Robotnik battles in Sonic, the Devon Shell battles are as simple as it gets, with no real patterns to learn or anything like that. Just shoot them a bunch of times anywhere you want, don't die, and that's it. Some of the bosses themselves are pretty cool in design though, like this giant Jazz Jackrabbit clone and Zunik, which is an obvious mashup of the characters Zool and Sonic the Hedgehog. Once you beat a boss, you get a little cutscene of some kind, ranging from rather simple ones on the floppy disk version to those that are fully animated Looney Tunes inspired cartoons on the CD-ROM edition. Yeah, the CD-ROM enhanced version of Jazz Jackrabbit came the following year in 1995. On top of new full motion videos, it included three new A, B, and C episodes, which kind of throws the chronology of the game out of whack a bit since they take place some time before the final clash, but it doesn't really seem to say when. You also get access to a special Christmas episode, Holiday Hair 94 and the option to play just bonus levels if you want. If you ask me, this is the definitive version of the game you want to play since it's just the same game, but bigger and better and more jazzy and jackrabbity. There are also some other versions of the game you might run across if you go looking for it online. You've got the Holiday Hair episodes like the aforementioned 1994, and there was also a 1995 variety. These were essentially shareware versions of the game with a Christmas theme and unique levels, and they're at least as awesome as finding an extra slice of pizza in a pizza box that you were about to throw out. Whatever that means. You'll also see these versions of the game by BNN Software, like this CD-ROM titled Jazz Jackrabbit Trilogy. This is an odd one, and was sold in stores like Kmart in the late 90s. It only came in this jewel case form that I'm aware of, and provides the first three episodes of Jazz Jackrabbit. So it's not just the shareware game, but it's certainly not the full registered game either. BNN also released this version of the game in a box, simply titled Jazz Jackrabbit, around the same time. It's a bit deceptive, since it's only the first shareware episode of the game, not the full game. So there's really no reason to seek this one out unless you're just an obsessive collector like someone I know. I also find it frickin' weird that the only screenshot on the back of the box is of the unreleased beta version of the game, from before the final design of Jazz Jackrabbit. The last things I want to touch on are some neat little Jazz Jackrabbit extras, starting with the cheat codes. One of these allows you to spawn the hoverboard to use anywhere and any level, which is just awesome, because the hoverboard is just awesome. And exploring areas you aren't supposed to is a wonderful pastime of mine. Another cheat unlocks Nightmare difficulty, and judging by the cheat code itself, Doom, I'm sure you can figure out what it's alluding to. Finally, in early versions of the game, you have a direct jab at Epic Mega Games' biggest competitor of the time, Apogee Software Limited. Type in their name and the game will slow down to a crawl and use terrible low-color graphics, which was a not-so-subtle reference to Apogee still releasing comparatively slow games with 16-color EGA graphics. On top of that, it was referred to as Apology Mode, which was admittedly pretty mean. Apogee didn't take the joke very well, and either sued them or threatened them with legal action and made them take the code out on later releases of Jazz Jackrabbit. However, if you use any of these, the game will take note and show you this screen at the end of the episode instead of the usual ending. Clever. Lastly, the game was written in the Turbo Pascal language, so getting the game to run on anything much more powerful than a Fast 486 isn't that straightforward. The version of the language used simply will not work on faster CPUs. You either had to limit your CPU somehow or download and apply a patch, often known as the TP patch, which fixes the executable to run on faster machines. Of course, running it in DOSBox is always an option nowadays, and it runs pretty well, certainly good enough to play, even on default config settings. The problem is going to be locating a copy of the game. Since it was a shareware game and was for the longest time only available directly from Epic Mega Games, original copies of the game are stupidly hard to find. And the later releases aren't always easy to find either, and many of those, like the BNN versions, aren't even complete games worth getting. I wish they would release this on good old games or Xbox Live Arcade or something because the demand for it is still there. You've got websites like Jazz2 Online which are a testament to that fact. It seems like the best bet is to go to EpicClassics.com where you can supposedly still order a copy written to a cheap CDR or something for $25. Wherever you can find the game though, I can assure you the experience is worth it. 
There is very little to complain about with Jazz Jackrabbit, and it was a pretty big hit back then and still enjoys a dedicated cult following today. It also had an excellent sequel, Jazz Jackrabbit 2, which we'll talk about some other day, and a lackluster Game Boy Advance game and a 3D platformer that was never completed. But there is talk in the air of a possible reboot or re-release sometime, but even if that doesn't happen, the original and totally rad Jazz Jackrabbit will always be around, and it is superb. If you like DOS games, platform games, or just having fun in general, I'd recommend Jazz Jackrabbit with as much enthusiasm as my lazy self can muster. 